So, hi everybody. <laughs> um, this, this talk will be about the Firefox OS Tricorder app, uh, which I made, which I launched on the phone as well here. Uh, you'll see uh, a mock, uh, screenshot on screen later as well. Uh, it's the main part of the talk will be about how you actually access uh, device sensors uh, on Firefox OS devices. Uh, I'm, as, as, as Joanna already mentioned, I'm Cairo uh, Robert Kaiser. I'm not maintaining CMonkey anymore. That, that was the past. Uh, I handed that over to other people in the community. I'm working for Mozilla QA now as a project manager. Uh, and the slides for, for this are already up at slides.cairo.at, which is my domain for all slides that I ever had. Uh, there are a lot of links in there to the web APIs and to the actual function, uh, documentation of the functions on MDN. So uh, if you're interested in, in that stuff, you, you can look up that in the slides and it, they should work in modern uh, web browsers, at, at least in Firefox. Didn't test anywhere else. So first, what is a tricorder? Uh, it's a sensor device as seen in Star Trek and it displays data that is just needed for the story in, in, in the script. Uh, so it, it takes them at plot speeds and accuracies and uh, in resolutions, just whatever the plot for the story needs. Uh, so the, what, whatever is seen on screen is usually pretty useless, but it looks fine and nice. Uh, the Firefox OS Tricorder app actually has real data on it uh, that it displays. It displays data from device sensors as exposed by uh, the web APIs. Uh, it's available from the marketplace uh, just under the name Tricorder. Uh, and the code is up uh, on my GitHub uh, account as well. Uh, so you can look it up there. I will have very abbreviated pieces of code in there, uh, in there if you want to, to see how it actually plays all together. Uh, just look it up at, uh, at GitHub. I hope it's documented well enough that you actually can understand it. So this is how it looks. Just, just so you see, it looks the same uh, on, the, on the phone itself. Uh, the most important thing for a Star Trek app is it needs to have a start date. Uh, which is uh, usually pretty nonsensical, and this, this one is just taking every year a thousand units and uh, starting with the point that the first Star Trek episode uh, aired in the US. Uh, then it has an area for the title. The, the whole interface is based on the Star Trek Next Generation and Voyager TV screen, uh, screens, so the L cars system. Uh, it, it has those navigation items with, uh, for the modules uh, that expose different kinds of sensors. And it has a full screen button so that you can get the experience without the, uh, the, the title bar on the phone, which just immerses you more in, in the experience. So uh, I talked about those modules, uh, and I'll, I'll go through the uh, the, the uh, interfaces uh, module by module. Uh, what I'm calling a module here is some HTML that exposes the, the, the switch button and the, the actual UI. Uh, and a JavaScript object that has two methods, activate and deactivate. Uh, that's, those are automatically called uh, by the functions when you, when you switch between the modules. So the active one is deactivated, the other one uh, is activated. So we properly shut down everything that we had uh, active from the last module. So let's go into the actual code here. Uh, the position module is the first one uh, in the list because it's the first one I did. Uh, I already had played with an application with some GPS stuff, uh, Lantia Maps, uh, uh, OpenStreetMap based. Uh, GPS track recording application uh, app for Firefox OS. So I knew a little bit about that. My main 
reason for doing this tricorder app was I wanted to play with, uh, with the APIs we have available and I thought what better than to do just something that exposes all the sensor data and as that matches the tricorder, that's what, where it comes from. So position is just a GPS or a Wi-Fi or cell, a mobile cell location that's all hidden behind the geolocation API. So uh, if we don't have GPS, we just take, uh, we just send a request out to the Mozilla location service that includes what mobile cell you're seeing and what Wi-Fi networks you're seeing. And if we have data for that uh, point, uh, we can send you back where you are. If we don't have data for the point, for that point, it's good if you're using a, a, the most Stambler, Stambler app to actually help us collect data for that. Uh, our database is way more privacy sensitive than the alternatives out there from Google or Apple, so uh, uh, anyone who can help us there is, is welcome. Uh, so we're using the geolocation API and we need to specify the geolocation permission in the app manifest uh, for Firefox OS apps, even though normal websites just can use it, uh, but for uh, web apps we want to ha have those thi things that they are using that could be sensitive to be mentioned, uh, but will prompt the user in any case uh, if they actually want to expose it. This is how it looks in this case. So geolocation has two main functions, one to get the current position and one to continuously get the uh, position when you move. Uh, this is the one I'm using here, so that's watch position uh, on the navigator.geolocation object. Yes, you see the, the blue there that's, uh, on the slides, that's actually the link to the documentation. Uh, and you get a call, uh, you put a call back in there that has uh, the, the one argument, which is the position. On that, you have a cord, uh, chords uh, property that has the actual data underneath it as latitude, longitude, accuracy, and a number of others. You also put an error function in, in, in case it doesn't work, which can happen uh, a lot if, you look, if the user does not acknowledge the, the prompt or something like that. And we're enabling high accuracy there to be sure we get a GPS position uh, if it's available uh, and some, some timeouts. One thing is important in all of those examples, I have that uh, at the end, how to clear up. Because uh, this will continuously call that call back uh, as soon as we have any location change. So we need to stop that at some point when we deactivate uh, the watch in the, or the module in the tricorder uh, and we call clear watch. And that's the reason why uh, above there we, we sorry. The uniforms were not made for microphones. Um, that's the reason why we have this watch ID up there uh, that we assign in the beginning uh, because we needed to actually uh, know what we're clearing uh, when we deactivate it. The second thing I did was uh, I called it gravity module because it actually measures, it measures Earth's gravity as a side function from what it's doing. Uh, it uh, accesses the accelerometer and the magnetometer, so magnetic compass uh, in, in 3D. Uh, with the APIs for that are actually events, the device orientation and device motion events, and those don't need any permission at all. You can even use that in websites. Uh, without any prompt or anything. Uh, the code for that is, as I said, it's events, so you need to add an event listener on uh, the window, uh, and you just add the event listener for this event uh, with which function is being called. You'll see I'll have, I have this uh, dot in, in all of this, those things. As I said, the module is a JavaScript object, so I'm setting this, this all on the JavaScript object of that module so that I don't pollute the namespace of anything else. Uh, the event that's being called, uh, the, the function that's being called for the, that event, uh, and I never remember what the true is, but everybody specifies it everywhere, so 
I, I have always have it in there. Uh, for so you have orientation. That's actually the magnetometer. So uh, the orientation of uh, of the device uh, with angles in uh, all three, uh, three directions and motion is the accelerometer. The orient event. So the, those is uh, that's the orient event function on the uh, on the module that takes the, the event gives you this orient data uh, in, in, uh, as, that you have in a, as an argument on the function. And you get alpha, beta, gamma angles in degrees there. The directions of those angles, there's a pretty good page on MDN that describes how, the, uh, how those work, which directions those, those are. So it's best to look them up there, because it would take a, a longer time to describe that here. It's better to look it up. They have graphics for that and to illustrate things like that. Uh, for the motion event, it's pretty similar. But on the event, you have actually uh, a property. You have two properties. One is acceleration, and one is, is acceleration including gravity. The acceleration including gravity is the one that always works. The acceleration one only works if you uh, have a gyroscope so that the uh, phone actually knows how to sub subtract the Earth's gravity from the value that it's measuring. So the acceleration, including gravity, is the one that always works. And for a tricorder, uh, if you go to a foreign planet, you want to know what the gravity of this planet is. So it's, it sounds fun to have that included in this case anyhow. Uh, so you get uh, on this acceleration, including gravity, you get x, y, and z coordinates in meters per se uh, second squared. Uh, and of course, if you perform the, the calculation in, in 3D space uh, to, to even those out, you get a, around 9.81 meters per second squared on Earth. Uh, and on the flame, it's even mostly accurate. Uh, it depends on how good the accelerometer is, uh, how accurate it is. You'll get lots of calls to those events. So it, if you're using that in, any, in an application, you might want to figure out uh, how to smoothen over that or, uh, or something like that, because you, you get really tons of those events. I'm handling everyone and just displaying it, but in other uh, thing you might want to, to deal with that differently, or leave out some of those or something like that. Um, of course, when clearing up, you need to remove those event listeners. Otherwise, you would call those functions uh, in a never-ending uh, loop until the battery is gone or whatever, or you close the app, of course. Uh, but remove event listener just mirrors exactly the add event listener function. You just need to care that you're doing it. Um, the next one is probably the most complicated example I have in this, is the sound module. It, it looks pretty innocent. Uh, the microphone. Microphone is, uh, is something that every phone has, and that has to be easy, right? Well, getting the microphone is easy. But what I'm doing is uh, you, I'm displaying uh, graphically uh, and the, an analysis of the data that I get in from the microphone. That's not that easy. Um, there's a few fun things in there. So for getting the microphone itself, we're using WebRTC or the Get User Media uh, piece of, get our, our, um, of WebRTC. Uh, for analyzing, uh, I'm using Web Audio, which is a pretty new standard, but it's extremely powerful, so what you're seeing is a very small piece of, of what it can do. Uh, the permissions you need is audio capture for the WebRTC get user media part uh, to actually fetch the audio data from the microphone. And it, that looks like this. As I said, probably the most complicated uh, piece I have in there. And what I feared is true that we, we don't even see that completely here. Uh, so the easy part is the navigator.getUserMedia call uh, itself. We said audio true because we only want to have the microphone. GetUserMedia could fetch uh, video from the camera as well. 
but uh, or, or a single picture from from the camera. We only want an audio stream so that we uh, uh, hand over audio audio true, and then a callback function that is actually uh, called with the stream we get uh, as an argument. So inside of that, we set up. Uh, the audio context for web audio, and that's where it's a, a little bit more difficult. Um, first, we assign that, that local stream to, uh, to a property. That's because of the cleanup. Of course, we want to turn off the microphone uh, when, we're, when we're leaving the module, so we need to stop the stream at that point. Um, then we create a new audio context uh, connect, uh, create an input with, uh, where we, for the input, we uh, specify a stream source, uh, and that is the audio stream that we just did get. Then we create an analyzer so we can actually analyze the data that is coming in there. Uh, and you'll, you'll see there's uh, spelling differences. I'm using American spelling in my variables, but they're using British, British spelling in the API, so that's, uh, be careful when you write that. Um, you create an analyzer. You actually need to set up the FFT size and stuff like that of the, of the analyzer, but I don't want to go in, into those details here. Um, and then you connect the analyzer to the input, and then you're set up, basically. Uh, then, uh, what you still need to do is, in, in my case, I'm, I'm displaying it graphically, so I'm, uh, I'm doing a, a loop with request uh, animation frame so that uh, on every time we are able to display uh, a, a frame, we are calling this function to actually display something. And in there, you create, uh, we create an, an array, in, uh, fixed, uh, typed array in this case, and this is a C-inspired API. Uh, so it has those strange things that you actually hand over the array to the function, which is you, something you usually don't do in, in JavaScript. Uh, you hand over the array that the data will be put in as an argument in the function. It's something that people doing C, C++ code do all the time, but in JavaScript it's, it's a bit of a, a strange construct. Uh, and then you have this data uh, actually populated and you can do something with it. I'm leaving that out and all the display because this piece uh, is complicated enough for the short time uh, we have here. So if, if you want to, to see more details on that and how the code works in, in detail, uh, just look, uh, look up the GitHub page uh, and you get more of it. You saw that, it, that it's actually working. so. I have all the bits and pieces to connect there. Uh, I had some sensors that, that uh, are interesting that, that we have them in there and that might uh, have some creative, creative uses that I hadn't covered with any other modules, uh, like the light sensor and the proximity sensor. And that was just two lines on there, so I uh, realized I could maybe put uh, an on-off for the flashlight on the on the camera uh, in there as well. It doesn't work anymore on my nightly builds, but it works on some, on older builds. So I, I just saw. Did you try it on, on the tricorder app? Okay, yeah, yeah. On, on two point one, it also worked on my, uh, on mine. Now it nightly changed something and it broke. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's two events again: device light and device proximity. It would be the camera API for the flashlight, uh, and that would, would need a permission. The other two don't. I don't have the code for the flashlight on here because the camera API is kind of strange uh, as well. So it's basically the same thing as we had with those other two events with the accelerometer and magnetometer. You add event listeners, uh, then you get uh, the arguments in the functions. You get a value in Lux for the light, and you get uh, proximity data, uh, a value in centimeters, and a minimum and a maximum. The, the flame 
only can, can tell you if it's more than five centimeters or less than five centimeters. Uh, but you get the minimum and maximum uh, levels that tell you what the maximum value is you will get and the minimum value. And you, on the flame, you always will get either five, which is equal to the max, or zero, which is e equal to the min. But on other devices, you might get more uh, if they have better sensors. Of course, you need to remove those, and as I said, uh, the flash or torch works with, with the camera API, with the get camera, and so on. I won't go into this, but you can look it up in the code. Uh, the, the camera API also is subject to change uh, as we are trying to get it into standards uh, and, try, and discussing with other uh, players on the web how to do stuff correctly there. The last thing, and I, I will do, do this very fast because I'm uh, time-wise also getting to the end. Uh, the device module uh, is pretty simple. That's, I only have the battery status API there, so uh, I want to at some point add free storage there, but uh, I didn't get to that yet. The code for that, you, you, you don't even need to do any complex functions there. You just have the value at navigator.battery.level, which is between zero and one. So you multiply it by 100 if you want to get percent. Uh, you get a battery.charging that is true or false, depending on if a charger is uh, on there or not. If it's charging, you get a charging time in seconds. If it's discharging, you get a discharging time in seconds, how long it still will last, probably. Uh, both of those have uh, zero or infinity values when, when it's unknown due to uh, different reasons. Uh, otherwise, you get a value in seconds. And with that, I hope we have time for one or two questions. That's Mr. Tricorder, if you ever saw the movie. <laughs> um, so do we have any, uh, any questions? I think one or two we can do. Uh, so the question is, I need to repeat them for the recording, uh, if we can change the frequency of that device orientation and probably device motion events. Uh, I haven't seen anything to change it, so you probably just need to select which ones you actually handle. Uh, you, get, you get tons of them. I think any time that value changes and that time goes into a, a number of decimal places, I think any time it changes, you, you get uh, something. And those sensors are noisy, so you actually get multiple calls uh, a, a second, I think even per millisecond or whatever. It's, it's pretty fast. I haven't tried it, but you, you, see, uh, you see for a labyrinth game or something you need it in high frequency. I saw a, a, a game like that that worked decently, but yeah, it, I, I'm not sure. For display, it's, it's good enough. Uh, for other causes, I didn't actually try. So, yeah. So the, the question is, what, uh, as web pages have those capabilities as well, what it will help for, uh, for web pages. Um, so for a, a normal uh, web page, I don't think there's too much value in, in the number of those. The battery API can have some value if you're doing some intense stuff and say, hey, this person is out of battery. Let's, let's try to scale it down to save the, uh, their power. Uh, let's say a messaging app, uh, let's slow down the, the refresh rate or something to uh, save their power. Something like that might be useful from the battery API. Stuff like orientation and motion for a desktop computer, it doesn't change, so it, it's not, not really helpful. Uh, but for, for doing, as, as he said, games, uh, it, it can be a quite interesting thing. 
there's also a vibration API that I'm not, not using here because it's not really a sensor that you can make the, the device vibrate if you're the, the frontmost web page or, or app. Uh, for example, when you jump over uh, something in a game, you can do a short vibration, things like that. So especially for games and things like that, uh, I think it's pretty helpful. For a normal web page, it, it depends. For the, the, luck, the light sensor might be interesting to actually uh, change contrast, stuff like that. So yeah, we're, we're out of time. Thank you. Uh, and, and live long and prosper.